They're making minimum wage, maybe a few pennies more, about $7.25 an hour. That's what they're making. And so we've got to make sure that we're fair for them because, quite frankly, Mr. President, they said that, that you know, a lot of the folks that, that are working in their programs also wind up having to be served by their programs. So they're caught in a vice, in a trap. They're caught in an economic trap where they can't escape from. And the reason why they can't escape from it, Mr. President, is because of the thinking about so many folks in the majority in this chamber, driven probably by one person, all right, who says that it's okay for poor people to get poorer, who says that low-income working people, and this is a quote I believe admitted to on the floor of this body, said that all they're th thinking about is where they're going to get their next drugs from. He said, it's okay. That they, that, that they really don't go to work anyway. <laughs> Scoffed at low-income working people. Hated low-income working people. Introduced legislation that would make sure that low-income working people stay low-income working people. Or almost better yet, stay no, become no-income working people. That's a time that we were supposed to have gotten rid of hundreds of years ago, Mr. President. But it seems like there's some in this chamber, in this body, who want to keep people that way. They choose not to invest in their education system. They choose not to invest in their income. They choose not to invest in their chances about transforming their life, transforming their situation. They choose not to invest in the resiliency that exists in so many of these individuals and they want to hold up our opportunity to try to make a better way for thousands, if not millions of people in this Commonwealth who are only looking for a little bit of help. Before I came up to Harrisburg this morning, Mr. President, I listened to a radio program. This is a young man being interviewed. He figured out his way to get to LaSalle College. You know that institution, Mr. President, a fine university in Philadelphia, southeastern Pennsylvania serves thousands. He figured out a way to get to LaSalle High School. And why is his story so special, Mr. President? Because most of his high school years, most of his four years while he was in high school, he was homeless. He was living on the street. He was living in a shelter. He was living in a, in a diner, catching naps or brushing his teeth in a local diner or a local fast food place. And he knew he made some bad decisions. He knew there were some family issues that he could not get through. But he was homeless for most of his high school years. But he figured out a way to get through. He figured out a way to get to college. Now that is the exception and not the rule, Mr. President. That is the exception that represents the resiliency and represents the potentiality of so many of our young people and so many of the citizens of the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania with a little bit of help, with a little bit of support, Mr. President, thousands if not millions of young people can have the same opportunity with a little bit of help. But maybe, or it seems like, there are folks around here who don't want to provide that assistance to these folks. I mean, they'd rather keep them in poverty. They'd rather keep them down. They'd rather keep their senatorial shoe on their neck so that they never get a chance to rise up. Well, I reject that. I reject that concept. I reject that principle. And I reject the nonsense legislation that comes out of that. Raising the minimum wage to 850, Senator, 875 an hour. Senator uh, Beatty's for one second. Senator, you are great. You've been on a roll. I know you're a passionate guy, and uh, I just wanted to, for purposes of the Senate rules, just to keep in mind um, your passion is certainly important and relevant, 
the Senate rules uh, guide us to uh, be very, to use great caution with regard to anything that might be construed as of a personal nature, of a personal attack on another member, and I would ask the Senator to just keep that in mind as he proceeds. Please proceed, Senator Hughes. So, so noted, Mr. President, and I appreciate your knowledge and your recognizing of my passion. Also, please recognize the substance of which I'm speaking of here, that the legislation that I'm referring to, and I don't know if we can get a Senate bill on this particular piece of legislation, but that would be helpful, um, raises the minimum wage to $8.75 an hour in 50 cents increments over three years. Now, every other state around Pennsylvania is above that. So I guess we like to see folks move to those other states so they can get a better pay scale. Maybe that's the philosophy, all right? And not get a good pay scale here in Pennsylvania. And it's interesting, as you would note, Mr. President, that in 2006, we, the state of Pennsylvania, beat the federal government and raised our minimum wage prior to the federal government raising their minimum wage. You are part of that historic occasion, Mr. President. You are part of that. You voted for that. You signed on to that. And we were historic and recognized around the nation for that historic effort. Well, now we have an opportunity to do the same. The crime is we can't even get a vote on this particular piece of legislation, which raises the minimum wage over a three-year period to a whopping $8.75 an hour. A whopping $8.75 an hour. We can't even get a vote on that, let alone something much more impactful to low-income working people and to the entire community at large, which is to raise the minimum wage at least to ten ten an hour. And many of us are believers in the concept of $15 an hour, which would be much more appropriate and a greater opportunity to lift people out of poverty. And again, I remind you, all the research indicates that when you raise minimum wage, you do not kill jobs. All the research indicates that. But we're locked in. We're trapped. Can't get a compromise going on. Can't get a deal going on so that the people can get the resources and the services that they need because of an ideology that is transcending real, thoughtful, honest, public policy conversation. Mr. President, it is a sad day. We have come to a sad moment in the history of this state where the people have asked us for one thing, and we're giving them something exactly opposite of what they've asked for. The people have said they'll pay a little bit more if they get something in return, if they get an investment in our education system, if they get an investment in raising the minimum wage, if they get an investment in human service programs and restore their funding and move people to a point of humanity, humaneness. I represent a district, Mr. President, that has the tale of two, two worlds. Has an education system that's paying about $12,000 per child. And right in, in less than a mile and a half, in fact, 1.8 miles, there's another education system where they're spending about $24,000 per child. The state is supposed to be the equalizer in that process. When the, when the majority in this House, the majority in the Senate, has chosen to look the other way when it's time to equalize that, and when it's time to create a fair and balanced playing field for all of Pennsylvania's children. I submit, Mr. President, that the children in Philadelphia are just as equal and just as important as the children in any other community across the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. It's solely and simply because they live in a community that does not have the same economic, local same economic wealth, the state is supposed to make up the difference. But those in this chamber who would continue to want to perpetuate the policies of the last four years, the failed policies of the last four years, the policies that only only show more deeply and more clearly the inequity that exists. And I just want to make an observation, Mr. President, just an observation. I make no accusation, but just an observation. I wonder 
I wonder, Mr. President, if these children were not black, if these children were not brown, would the policy still be the same? Would the policy still be the same? Would the funding equation still be the same? I wonder. I wonder, Mr. President. It's a question that hundreds of thousands of people in cities across this Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, in cities across the nation, are asking the same thing. I wonder, I wonder, when are my children going to get a chance to have the opportunity to have a swimming pool in their school, to have books, believe it or not, Mr. President, school books in their school? I wonder when the, the, the parents ask the question, why do my children have to be in a classroom? There are 33, 34, 35 kids in a class. Why do my children have to be in a classroom where there are almost 60 or 70 children in a classroom? But the people in the majority in this chamber, controlled by one or two, seem to say that that's OK, that that inequity is OK that it's all right to have two kinds of education systems, those for those who have, those for those who don't have. And I just would say as an observation, that the ones that don't have consistently seem to be black and brown. So Mr. President, we've got to get out of this circumstance. We've got to jettison this idea We've got to move forward and represent the interests of all of people across the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania to give people a fair shot and not be ruled over by some dictatorship kind of attitude or philosophy that exists in the majority side of the equation of this party, of this chamber, of this building. We've got to move forward, Mr. President. We've got to raise the wage of the people of the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania all of them and not keep them in poverty. We've got to provide for a fully funded education system that recognizes that black and brown children are just as equal and just as important as anyone else in this commonwealth. And that there be a fair chance and a fair opportunity for everyone. Where is the moral outrage that we allow that to, to, to stay in place? Where we allow schools to not have nurses in them? where we allow schools to not have substitute teachers in them, where we say that that is acceptable and that is okay in the schools where the kids are black and brown as opposed to the schools where they're white. It's a philosophy that exists that we must rid ourselves of once and for all so that we can go back to dealing with the needs of the people of the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania and find the commonality that exists in all of us. And when there is a difference, discuss it and negotiate it fairly and appropriately. Not be threatened. Not be threatened, either politically or personally. Mr. President, we can do better. It's time we did. It's time that every one of us chooses to do the right thing and to do the best for the people that they represent and not do the worst. Washington, D.C. has invaded the capital of the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. The philosophies that exist in Washington have now come into this chamber. Search and destroy, seek and destroy, no matter who you are, to keep people in poverty to keep people in, a low, in, in, a, in, a, in an education system that does absolutely nothing for them, to not provide fair services for them, to not recognize compromise as the way to go. That's what we're dealing with here in Pennsylvania, Mr. President. It needs to be rejected, rejected flatly, and rejected wholeheartedly. We can do better. We have a responsibility to do better. We have a responsibility to make sure that everyone, no matter what their circumstance is, can see the light at the end of the tunnel and figure out a way to achieve that light. It is our moral obligation. It is our responsibility. It is what we signed up for. It is what we took the pledge for. 
to do the right thing for everyone in Pennsylvania and not trade off negatives to, treat, to achieve a negative event. Walmart raised their minimum wage. West Virginia raised their minimum wage. New York raised their minimum wage. Maryland raised their minimum wage. D.C. raised its minimum wage. Connecticut raises minimum wage. California raises minimum wage. Office workers who clean buildings in the city of Philadelphia just agreed upon a contract resolution where they will be paid almost $19 an hour. Congratulations to them. They raised their minimum wage. Fast food workers in communities all across the nation have stood up for themselves. They raised their minimum wage. They had to go to civil disobedience and raise their minimum wage. Why can't we do the same? Why can't we do the same? Why shouldn't we be in the business of helping people out and not keeping them, not keeping them in the poverty that is most accurately evidenced in Senate Bill 610? which would keep them in poverty for perpetuality. Perpetual poverty, that's what the majority seems to want. That's unacceptable. We can and should do better. Thank you, Mr. President.